Hi, good evening, and uh, it's good to be here together again. Uh, midweek Bible study. Um, I'll just read you some words from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, uh, 6 to 12. It says there, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Well, that's good advice, advice to live by. We are going to sing our first hymn together, number 34. Number 34, Angel Voices Ever Singing. You've got a lot to live up to, haven't you? Angel Voices Ever Singing. Round thy throne of light. end of the broadcast didn't live up to the uh, the angels uh, i can't speak for yours let's come to the lord in prayer shall we gracious heavenly father we just uh, want to thank you that as we come to you this evening we're praising you um the same as people around the world are doing uh, the same as the angels in heaven are doing and lord uh, we think of that time when the lord jesus ascended into heaven and the angels were praising the lord jesus uh, fresh from ascension, fresh from his resurrection appearances. Up from the grave he arose because he had died and it was finished. 
what he did for us upon the cross. Father, we thank you for his three years of public ministry and 30 years of obscurity before that, before he had originally come to earth as a child, all of heaven contracted to the span of a man. Father, we want to thank you. And Lord, see how things have turned out. We, uh, we just praise you, glorify you for what you have done. And here is a worldwide church all over the world, people praising and glorifying you and discovering that the path of discipleship can be tricky sometimes, it can be um, hard going, but uh, this is what our Saviour has gone before us. And Lord, we ask that uh, you'd help us to have the grace to follow after him with a good heart and a willing spirit. Lord, bless us, we pray together as, uh, as we come together tonight, uh, that we should hear and understand your word. And Lord, that you would lift up our spirits as we sing and as we pray uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read from Matthew's Gospel. and um, Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 19. Matthew 11, 1 to 19. Now, I would like to say that I have brilliantly planned this and uh, weeks ahead I knew exactly where we were going and what was going to happen, but I'm not that good at planning, to be honest. Um, so on Sunday we've been going through uh, John's Gospel, Chapter 1, and uh, we actually had three verses this week in Chapter 1. I think it was 5, 6 and 7, uh, something like that in which we touched on the on the John the Baptist and um, a couple of weeks ago I said that uh, we were going to be doing a series on um, facing uncertainty and I said three weeks ago we were going to look at Abraham first of all then Gideon and then John the Baptist so John the Baptist was there on Sunday and he reappears here midweek I'm grateful, that's all I can say. Matthew chapter 11 from verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not yet risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. If you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. But that has ears, let them hear. To what then shall I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Good advice. All right, well, we're going to sing now uh, one more time, number 579, number 579.
to deal with uncertainty and uh, this is where we are at the moment ourselves where we've been for the past six months really um, Abraham was told to leave where he was uh, but he wasn't really told where he had to go Gideon was faced with Israel's persecution by the Midianites and so he asked why was God allowing this if God was the God of Israel then why was Israel in so much trouble and today we have John the Baptist who announced the coming king. But when was he going to appear? When was that going to happen? So where, why and when? Uncertainty, facing uncertainty. And I was looking at John the Baptist and I was thinking about John the Baptist today and um, a cheeky question occurred to me. Why would Jesus have a forerunner? why would he want someone to go ahead of him and i was thinking about it and thinking i came up with a few ideas uh the first one being if i can reverently say a warm-up act um someone to go on before jesus took the stage to raise the spiritual temperature of the nation in readiness for the messiah it's a possibility jesus got somebody else to come along to actually build people up to be ready to listen to him secondly maybe jesus had somebody to go before him maybe to boost christ's humanity he was divine but he grew tired and he needed to eat so maybe he could have benefited from encouragement so john the baptist warm-up act boost to christ's humanity third he is a, a bit of an obscure one um, to establish Christ's credibility because uh, there's a Jewish thing about uh, witnesses in court that uh, matter is established by uh, two witnesses and actually perhaps it wouldn't be regarded as acceptable just to have Jesus say things maybe he needed somebody else so maybe it was that well you know I think none of those really work a great deal for me um to some degree maybe it was the first of those suggestions um uh, because anybody who does anything it has an effect on everybody who's around them and so uh, john speaking as he did introducing jesus as he did would have contributed to some degree to warming the spiritual temperature but i think really the um, the most obvious answer that it took me so long to to work out was uh, surely John came along simply to let them know who was coming to actually give a taster so they should know who it actually was who was coming along I was looking at some funny UK place names today and uh, I came up with a few that I could repeat and um, well just you think about it what would you be what would be your response as a visitor coming down the road and um, there is the place name that you're heading along and you see the street sign for a place in dorset called scratchy bottom would you like that how would you like to live in scratchy bottom or in kent apparently there's a place called thong okay aberdeenshire you don't want to be in broken wind 
there's actually a place called Broken Wind in Aberdeenshire and North Yorkshire a place called Crackpot. Okay so these are place names and they're going to be by the side of the road and the idea of the announcement of a place name is to be helpful and not distracting but anybody who sees those place names for the first time it's going to be a talking point. They're going to talk about it <coughs> and they're not going to have their eye on the road so much so maybe that's not such a great idea to have a funny name uh, for a place. John the Baptist exactly fitted the bill that he was needed to, to do. He was all about disappearing into the background as soon as the master arrived. But when was that going to happen? When was it going to happen? He was announcing something and when was it going to be? Well, we're going to look at John for a moment and uh, before we go any further. And looking at the scriptures, um, we see that John had actually three different job descriptions for what he actually did. And uh, John isn't like you and me. Uh, John was unique, really, uh, as he's been called the last of the Old Testament prophets. Well, in uh, Malachi 3 verses 1 to 3, Malachi was the last book of the Old Testament. And Malachi actually prophesied that John would come along. And I'll read to you what he said in uh, Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. God speaking through Malachi, he says this, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. So there is Malachi talking about John the Baptist and calling him the messenger of God. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Now, things have changed quite a lot since those New Testament days. And we're inclined to think of a messenger as somebody of uh, maybe a lowly, uh, poorly paid job and uh, doesn't have a lot of prestige. And you've seen the van drive up and somebody pops out the van and he's got something for you. So he puts it on your doorstep, rings the bell and heads for the hills. And you open the door and there it is for you and you don't think too much about the messenger. But, well, that's only how people think today. We need to get our heads around this to understand John. John was not an ordinary man doing a lowly job. John was indeed special, filled with the Spirit since birth, we're told. But that's not just what made John special. John was special because of whom he was a messenger for. He was special because of the one that he served. Now, if I came to you... And I said that I was bearing a message from Princess Anne. You would probably look at me a bit different to hearing that my message was from Prince Andrew. John's dignity is in his master. He's got a message, the first message that anyone in Israel has heard for quite some time. Straight from God. And it was a very significant message to have. John's dignity is in his master. Uh, and he's a messenger, but he's also a prophet. He's called a prophet. A prophet is one who might foresee the future or might declare a message from God himself. It's perhaps uh, a, a more traditional way of saying that John was to be God's messenger to the world. So it's a very similar sort of thing, really. He's a messenger of God, so he's a, a prophet. In Matthew 11, 7 to 9, which uh, I read for you just a few moments ago. Uh, Matthew 11, 7 to 9. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What do you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out and see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet. John was more than a prophet. He was a messenger from God, 
which actually made him a prophet, but he's given the dignity of having that name. You remember some other people in the Old Testament who had that name of prophet? And you know how I said to you earlier how I couldn't really have worked this out any better, um, how things have kind of come together, because on Sunday we were talking about John the Baptist, and here we are talking about John the Baptist. What were we talking about uh, midweek uh, meetings before we ever got to uh, dealing with um, uncertainty? Well, for quite some time we were looking at Elijah. This is the third title that we have for John the Baptist. <laughs> Elijah. How this all comes together. How this all sort of seamlessly works together. And I'd love to say that I had actually planned it, but no. He's a messenger, he's a prophet, and a man very much like someone else, a man like Elijah. In Malachi 4 verse 5, Malachi is still speaking about the prophet who's to come, the messenger of God, the one that he's already spoken of in chapter 3. In chapter 4, Malachi chapter 4 verse 5, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, which will be the second coming. Now this is actually... John the Baptist is coming before the first coming, before the, you know, before Jesus begins his public ministry. Some time to come, nobody knows when, Jesus is going to return. But that's the great and glorious day. But this here, Jesus coming and uh, he's going to send Elijah to come. It's interesting that this should be foretold uh, in such a way because Elijah never actually died. You might remember from our Bible studies that he was whisked away into heaven, not in a chariot of fire. The chariot of fire separated Elijah and Elisha, and he was carried up to heaven in a whirlwind. And um, people may well have been expecting the old prophet to actually show up again in the flesh, hundreds and hundreds of years after he disappeared. But that wasn't going to happen. And things are a bit explained a little bit more in Luke's Gospel. So I'll take you up in Luke 1, 13-17. This explains um, what Malachi was talking about in chapter 4. Luke 1, 13 to 17, where Zechariah is looking to have a child and is told by the angel, Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. To turn the hearts of the parents to their children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. When this man comes along who's going to be sent as a forerunner for the master himself, he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Well, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, which I read to you earlier, verses 13 and 14, you'd seen there, Matthew 11, 13 to 14, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. There is, Jesus is quoting back to Malachi and he's saying, yeah, that Elijah, I will send Elijah to you. Here he is. It's John the Baptist. So what we've got here, John the Baptist is a messenger of God, specifically a prophet of God, who actually not just speaks, but speaks things that are to come. And he's also in the same, uh, cut from the same cloth, as it were, as uh, Elijah. He's the same kind of a person, same kind of ministry as Elijah. Actually, as it turns out, he dressed like Elijah. Um, he appeared out of nowhere like Elijah because he'd been in, in the wilderness. He was outspoken like Elijah. But most importantly, he was prepared to give God's message, whatever it was, and however unpopular it was, quite boldly. He was rather outspoken. He would say what needed to be said. I think we might be getting the picture here of someone not sitting in a corner quietly. 
hoping so hard that things are going to work out. Here's someone who boldly gets on with whatever job he has. And while it's just going to look like courage there, and you, you might mistake it for bravery, but it isn't really. John the Baptist wasn't a brave, courageous speaking man. John the Baptist was someone with an unshakable conviction that God's got it under control. And you don't need to be brave when you know how things work out. You don't need to all get your courage together when you actually know the outcome anyway. You just go ahead and do it. And he's not paralysed by fear. He's not paralysed by doubt. He just gets on with it. Um, John the Baptist is a, a tremendous example. Just like Abraham and Gideon eventually came to believe in that, in that same strength and, and boldness. They didn't actually start like that. And they weren't that impressive, to be honest, to begin with. Neither Abraham nor Gideon. But when they carried on in their journeys, physically and spiritually, they certainly got there. And they were following the Lord, as they should have done. Well, this is John the Baptist, messenger, prophet, and Elijah. And where did he come to? Um, or what did he come to do? He was the messenger, he was the prophet, he was Elijah. What did he do? Well, in um, Malachi 3 verse 1, we read there that it was said, what's going to happen is, he will prepare the way before me. Okay, so he's going to prepare the way. What did he come to do? He made things in such a way that people were set up and they were ready for who was coming. Isaiah 40 verses 3 to 5 which is quoted even by Jesus in relation to John the Baptist. Isaiah 40 verses 3 and 5. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up Every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places are plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Do you know what, as I was listening to that, I was reading that, this is very much like the Fens, you know. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to feel as though um, the Lord had been really preparing this area um, for the return of the Lord Jesus? Every valley shall be raised up so there's no dips. Every mountain and hill made low, it's, it's flat everywhere. That's what he's saying that uh, John the Baptist was going to do. He was, he was going to deal with ethical or moral boundaries. He was going to deal with obstacles. He was going to get rid of them so that it would be an easy thing to do for people to make that decision about Christ because they weren't committed in relationships or committed in patterns of behaviour that would be difficult for them to get out of if they were going to follow Jesus. Um, he actually sorted that out before Jesus came. So John the Baptist came to prepare the way. Um, in Luke as well, Luke's Gospel chapter 1 verses 76 to 79, it's saying the same thing. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into paths of peace and here's Zechariah the child's father actually prophesying over his child and saying what's going to happen you'll be called a prophet of the most high you'll go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him I don't know how that must have made Zechariah feel to actually understand that, to actually say those things. The Messiah, the longed for Messiah, is coming and he's going to prepare the way for him. And hopefully he's going to come soon rather than a long time later. How did he do what he did? How did he prepare the way for the Lord? Well, actually, we looked at that uh, on Sunday 
we saw there that so he prepared the way first of all by teaching he taught about himself who he was he taught about jesus that he's the lamb of god came to take the sin uh, away from the world so he was actually teaching that the coming savior would be there to save from sin um, he lived his life as an example and is an example to us as much as anybody else of someone who just invested completely in what he knew to be truth and he didn't hold back he committed himself what to what he already knew and he acted on it um, so he taught he was an example and he finished off um, by warning people people need to be warned um, it's great to say God loves you God loves you he does but uh, it's more amazing to say God loves you um, you sinner um, and he loves you so much he provide, pro provided a way that you can be saved so um, here is John the Baptist this is what he, he came and, and did and the big question really was when was it going to happen then when was it going to happen well uh, John was happy he was ready for it all he said the bride belongs to the bridegroom the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice that joy is mine and it is now complete he must become greater I must become less he said that after the appearance of Jesus and he recognized Jesus and he called him a bridegroom and that the church or the people who would follow him would be his loved ones would be his his um, bride um, he said his whole purpose was just to point the way in John 1 31 the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel John's great isn't he? he's just a tremendous example to us um, and a, a great way to conduct himself but when when would it happen and I don't know if you're uh, really sort of um, really into this but you know why why I would be asking when because Malachi the last writer in the Old Testament wrote his book 400 years earlier and now John has been told that he's to announce the coming of the Messiah and well after 400 years is it going to be right now this minute how excited should I get people to be um, you know should I say you know keep watching the skies keep you know look out um, how how keen how, how, how would he know how would he even make himself known to people well you know it's not quite as much of a mystery as we might have thought because John knew Jesus John knew him ever before Jesus went out and uh, preached his first sermon he knew him before he um, he turned water into wine he knew him before John baptized anyone um, go back in history Mary Queen of Scots and Elizabeth the first were first cousins once removed I've always had problems working out what their relationship was but officially that's it Mary Queen of Scots Elizabeth the first <clears throat> were first cousins once removed but there was an earlier Mary and Elizabeth that were related to Mary the mother of Jesus and Elizabeth mother of John the Baptist the authorized version the King James 1611 version calls them cousins um, but I'm not sure how literal that was uh, all the other versions say that they were just related actually as it happens Mary was from the tribe of Judah Elizabeth from the tribe of Aaron so I'm not too sure how closely related they actually were but they're all Israelites so they're all inevitably related eventually anyway in Luke 1 verse 36 Gabriel tells Mary even Elizabeth your relative is going to have a child in her old age so because Elizabeth is going to have a baby and she's six months ahead of Mary John is always going to be six months older than Jesus and when Elizabeth's pregnancy is announced Mary goes over to visit and if she's going to visit when Mary herself um, is now waiting for the baby or is uh, going to be having a baby um, yeah there must have been some kind of strong link between them 
So we would imagine that Jesus and John, as they were growing up, uh, got to know each other quite well. And because John the Baptist knew Jesus quite well, he would have known that Jesus was special. You might have had friends when you were young, and um, you might have been friends with other people when you were young, and they know you very well, and they know, as I can think of someone <laughs> who knows me, who might have known some things that you're not proud of now. But John the Baptist knew Jesus when he was little, and Jesus didn't do a wrong thing. Jesus didn't say a wrong word. He didn't get angry for no reason. He wasn't cruel. He wasn't misbehaving. He didn't do anything wrong. And um, quite a, a special thing that that should have happened. Um, we're told in Luke 1 verse 80, John grew and became strong in spirit and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. Now, we're dealing with the Bible, and the Bible has so many words, and then it's silent, and it's not always helpful to speculate. But here's me breaking my own rule. Here's an idea. Why did John become strong in spirit and then go off and live in the desert, away from everybody else? Could it have been because he knew Jesus and he recognised in Jesus something so special that when somebody was cruel to Jesus, it wounded John. And when people told lies about Jesus, John was moved. When he saw these things happening, John grew and became strong in spirit. And rather than do someone a mischief, he hid away in the desert. Now that's complete speculation. It's an idea, isn't it? John is out there in the desert anyway. Somehow he's developing as a person or maybe other stuff is going on. He's, he's in the desert. He's out there. Um, but in that we know he wasn't forgotten about because in Luke chapter 3 verse 2 we read, The word of the Lord came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. How long was he out there for? How long was he there? We don't know. But while he was out there, the word of the Lord came to him. That's the popular way of saying that he was being told you've got to be a prophet. Here's something that you've got to say. And he knew that it was God talking to him. God told him to go and baptise people. So later we read in Matthew 3 verses 13 and 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptised by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptised by you, and do you come to me? John the Baptist clearly knew Jesus, but clearly he knew more about Jesus than most of the people who were there. He's saying, it's not right that I should baptise you. What I'm doing is, I'm giving the opportunity for people to publicly express their repentance. They are sorry for their sin. They're turning away from their sin. And you ask me to baptise you. I know you've never ever done anything wrong. Actually, I have. I need to be baptised by you. This is early John. Jesus replied, we carry on in Matthew 3, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfil all righteousness. Then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptised, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is John showing that he knows Jesus and he seems to be aware that Jesus is without sin. And now the flag comes down and all engines are engaged and things move pretty quickly from here on. Is John thinking to himself, OK, I've got to announce the coming Messiah. Who is it? When is he coming? I think maybe we're given sufficient clues to think 
they actually even knew who it was before Jesus came to be baptised. Maybe they had an idea of who it was anyway. And it was just a question of when Jesus was going to come forward publicly and actually claim what was his. John receives the word of the Lord in the desert and he starts baptising and Jesus comes. Not much of a wait, though every day must have been like the guests awaiting the groom to arrive at the wedding. We've got a wedding ourselves coming up soon. And um, they won't have that. We won't have the same thing as they did. Um, you know, I'm sure that the happy couple will be out there for hours having photos taken. That didn't happen then. But you know what it's like when you're waiting for the wedding to kick off? Um, you know, let's have some food. Um, you know, you have that waiting. This is what it was like then. John was waiting every day. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. We don't know how long it was, but here he is. John, the herald, the announcer, a preparer. How long would his job be for? How long is he going to need to do that? After a while, there was going to be murmurings that the one who had been awaited wasn't actually going to turn up at all anyway. John himself may have had doubts about Jesus when he himself was in prison, but no doubts or worries are going to slow God's plan or speed it up. That's a good thing for us to remember. Things are going on and you don't really know how they're going to be. And you don't know what the consequence is. And you're thinking, I don't know how that's going to turn out. And because we don't know, because John the Baptist didn't know, it didn't mean Jesus was going to be slower or quicker. He was going to turn up exactly the right time we don't know how things are going to turn out but God does and he's going to turn up and he's going to show up and he's going to make things happen just at the right time too we can trust him John the Baptist had to trust him we're going to have to trust him too for the right time we need to preserve the idea that God has called us to our lives um, God moves in mysterious ways, people have always said. That's true. But he also moves at the right pace for his plan to come through. And if his plan appears mysterious at the moment, it might not eventually. But he will be going at the right pace for his plan to come through. Okay, if um, God has called you to your life, in the way that your life is at the moment, uh, it's not a bad thing if you can actually improve your life, uh, make it better, that's fine. But um, what you've got to know is you're not shipwrecked. You're not shipwrecked. You're not adrift and um, abandoned and forgotten about and hopeless. Because there's a lot of waiting involved, doesn't mean you're forgotten about. They waited 400 years for a prophet tell them anything from God. 400 years is a lot longer than you and me are going to have to wait. And God's plan is there and he's called us to it. God put you where you are and you didn't just fall out of the car there. He put you where you are. Maybe he'll help you move on. Maybe things will get better. But don't fight the Lord about today. Don't complain about how things are right now because he's the one who made it like that like John Abraham and Gideon you are the man or the woman for this time in this place Proverbs 19 23 says the fear of the Lord leads to life then one rests content untouched by trouble it all starts with fear of the Lord, not being terrified, but actually respecting him, having him in his place, giving him his due, being the servant to the master. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. If you put the Lord ahead of you, let him take the strain, you're going to come through okay. It's all 
going to work out. Okay, let's see. This is number 1220. Number 1220. Because when all things are said and done, it all comes back to the same thing all the time. The greatest love that the Lord has ever shown us. say amen to my prayer. I'll say amen to your prayers. And uh, we can share in this thing together. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the examples of people uh, in the scripture and what they can teach us. I want to thank you, Lord, that there is no whitewashing, that uh, we see doubts, we see fears, we see misbehavior, we see all the things that we sometimes see in ourselves mirrored in these men and women in the Bible. So few characters in the Bible that have no sin mentioned against them. Um, even David, the apple of your eye, uh, he did terrible things. Uh, and yet, Lord, um, you just say you don't condemn. Just go away and don't do it again. Uh, be sorry enough to repent change behavior. Father, we just want to thank you for your mercies to us. Thank you for your grace that uh, you can take any one of us, Lord, and you can show us and you can speak to us and, and we'll know in our hearts, Lord, that it's true that Jesus has died for us and that um, you know, we don't have to go through life trying to be good enough. We don't have to go through life with a tremendous burden of guilt on our backs that done these terrible things but we can know that you love us enough that that um, it's all been paid for uh, and uh, we just need to trust the one who's done that for us thank you lord for for what jesus has done thank you for the gospel thank you for salvation we pray lord that um, this message will resound around um, this town and whatever town that anybody is listening to this is in Lord, that uh, people should hear more and more of him, and less and less of just church or religion or that terrible word that people are using so much today, faith or faiths. And Lord, we don't need just uh, these ideas. We need the Lord Jesus. We need to know about him through his word, but we don't need to just practice a lot of religious things. 
thank you Lord for this virus that's teaching us that so we can know you and uh, not have to be ever so religious we can know you and we don't have to know all the right times to stand up and sit down in church and which books to use and what words to say father we just thank you that it's actually between you and us and uh, lord we want to thank you for that lord we look forward to a day when we can meet together with other people who believe as we do and uh, we want to thank you that you call people out of the world so that we can um, encourage one another in these things but uh, lord our bond is not that we know the right words our bond is just in the person that we believe in so lord we just try and keep these things simple and we pray lord for your grace to help us lord we just uh, want to pray at this time for people who are, are suffering because they're scared um, and because maybe they have doubts as well i want to pray for people who are losing a sense of um, how things should be and they're growing a bit distant lord and they feel um, not happy and, and troubled lord we know that there's an increasing number of people like that in the world today and uh, lord for each one of them we would pray your kindness and your goodness uh, to appear to them we pray our god for your children who might be uh, suffering some of these things lord we pray that so you would help them to reach out to others and uh, lord we pray that there'll be a welcome voice to speak to and uh, lord that there'll be encouragement um, for them father we thank you that some people are able to get together and we pray lord that um, that should increase and, and continue uh, and we pray lord for safety as as that goes on oh it's a massive world out there and we see the numbers and we hear uh, of what's going on in different parts of the world in uh, the us and brazil and uh, we've seen a, a terrible death rate in belgium as well uh, lord we just want to bring these people to you uh, especially those who have no um, no sense, no, no hope of, of anything ahead of them. That uh, for them, uh, the virus brings the grave and that's the end of everything. And there's nothing more to talk about. Lord, we just want to pray for people like that, that they should be given hope, that they should know that Jesus came to give hope and he came to um, bring awareness of sin. Uh, yet at the same time, he came to forgive that sin lord we pray that people should get to grips with those things and lord that they should come to know you we pray that you'd help us all uh, to play our part in this world uh, to be kind and to be good and to tell people about the lord jesus and to when we can't tell them about him that we should live uh, the kind of life that he wants us to we pray lord that you would hear our prayers for one another as for those who are looking forward to something those who are dreading something that you give us all grace to live today today and uh, lord leave tomorrow till tomorrow we pray lord that you would help us to just trust in you as things go on and now lord we come uh, and bring our own prayers to you in jesus name amen Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord for every prayer prayed and uh, may the Lord hear and answer. We're going to sing our closing song, number 1016 in um, Mission Praise, 1016. I don't know if this is a bit corny to sing this at the end of a meeting, when the music fades, because it's the last one that we're singing, but uh, it seems an appropriate thing to say anyway.
when the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, a song in itself. There's nobody helping quite. You reach much deeper within. The way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm so Lord for the thing I made. Again, it's uh, great to be with you and uh, great to be sharing in these things. Um, good to look at uh, John the Baptist tonight. Great to remember uh, the people that the Lord has used. And, um, you know, it wasn't easy for any of them. And it was pretty tough. And they had questions. And the Lord helped them and they persevered. Um, we'll just close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to give our burdens to you and the things that weigh us down help us to offload them onto you so that we're not carrying them anymore just to leave them with you and trust you to go forward without them lord we pray that you'd help us to trust you like john abraham and gideon and lord we ask that uh, all those things that we don't know that we don't understand that we'll be happy because you're in charge Lord, bless us and keep us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, good to be with you. And on Sunday, it's the first Sunday of the month, so it's communion on Sunday. So uh, join us with, with your own. A little bit of wine, doesn't have to be wine. It's nice if it's red, anything that's red. If not, that's okay. Nobody else is going to see. But... Uh, bread and wine and uh, we'll have communion um, as we do first Sunday of the month. Okay, hope to see you then. All right, bye-bye.